have two distinguished uh, uh, folks who have uh, dedicated a lot of, of their time to a very important uh, subject, especially for us Russians and for world history for that matter. Um, you know that uh, back in the 70s, uh, a group of enthusiasts, uh, geologists and history buffs and uh, um, a gentleman who made uh, in the Soviet Times documentaries, Gil Yaryabov, uh, found the remains of the last royal family uh, near Ekaterinburg. Uh, and uh, uh, my Matushka and I had the uh, honor of meeting these people uh, back in the 80s when uh, this was not being publicized. We we went to Gil Yaryabov's apartment, we had long conversations with him, and we kept up our con our friendship and uh, uh, I was uh, uh, found worthy to be able to serve um, a Vesper service at the place where the relics were really found, uh, ultimately. In any case, um, uh, it was um, shown by various uh, DNA experts in the world that these are indeed the uh, remains of the uh, royal family, uh, missing two. And they were found years later, and also identified as um, uh, belonging to the uh, children of the, of the last Russian uh, Tsar. And uh, uh, among the people who studied these, these relics was Dr. Michael Koval uh, of the Air Force's uh, DNA Identification Lab in Rockville, uh, Maryland. And uh, he was gracious enough to come and uh, speak to our Parish uh, a few years ago, and as I mentioned uh, just recently, unfortunately he hasn't learned Russian uh, since then, but we will forgive him uh, because he's done a lot of good uh, for, for Russian history and uh, by, by participating and identifying uh, the uh, DNA of the royal family. And also we have with us uh, Captain uh, Peter Sarandinaki, uh, whom we've known a long time. I married them, he and his wife 25 years ago in Nyack, New York. Um, we're actually relatives. And, and um, Peter has been uh, uh, very active in, uh, in the uh, Romanov remains uh, issue. And also he, he is searching, he's begun searching for the remains of uh, Mikhail Alexandrovich Romanov uh, in Perm. And uh, he will speak uh, about that as well, which is a very, very interesting. And uh, hopefully they're getting closer and closer to finding the remains of uh, uh, the other Romanovi. So please, I'm going to pass the microphone on to Dr. Kobol and uh, Peter Serodinaki. I think Peter will go first yes. and uh, uh, say a few words about uh, his organization, Search. And then uh, we will go back and forth between the two. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for your patience in waiting for this. Uh, I, I, we're very happy to be here with you and to tell you about our work uh, for the past uh, 25 years. Uh, my, uh, what we'll do is first, we'll, my purpose is to talk about the history of the search for the Romanov remains, their identification, and then I will talk about the search for the remains of Michael Romanov. Um, the, my story, uh, I first learned, I, I'm a retired sea, American sea captain and merchant marine. And um, how, how does an American sea captain uh, get, uh, get uh, involved in all this? Well, uh, I heard all these stories about, I first heard all these stories about the Romanovs from my grandmother when I was 10 years old. Um, she started telling me how uh, my great-grandfather, who was head of the Vendensky Regiment in Pienza, Russia, um, was a very good friend of uh, then-investigator Nikola Sokolov. And together they would go hunting in, uh, before the First World War, and they were very good friends. Um, when the uh, war started, my, the, the regiment was transferred to the front, and then Later on, my great-grandfather went up in rank and became a lieutenant general in the Tsarist army. Uh, when um, the, the, uh, 
he was saved by his troops actually and not killed. Um, at first he was, uh, he fought, he didn't fight, but he was part of the, Red, became part of the Red Army, but he started working with uh, General Kutepov, who uh, started an underground railway to save as many officers as they could um, fr and send them off to the newly formed uh, White Army. So what he would do is uh, he would send my grandmother, who was then 18 years old, dressed like a, a cleaning girl, uh, into the Lubyanka prison. And uh, she would go and uh, get the laundry from the officers who were about to be killed, uh, but still they did the laundry. And um, in that laundry were pieces of paper that, with the names and addresses of officers that needed to be saved. And how uh, she wrote it, and as uh, she told me that she went countless times into the prison getting those, uh, getting the laundry and the names, and she f saved uh, a lot of officers um, to, who went on to fight against the Reds. Um, later on, so my great grandfather escaped, went over to Siberia, and, um, and then started, was working with the general staff. Uh, his uh, left his wife and and uh, and, and uh, two daughters in Pianza, and then they followed uh, escape by using the what they call the nuns route, going from monastery to monastery, and so forth. And my grand great grandfather gave my grandmother a Nagant pistol, and he said, "Use six bullets, and the last ones for yourself." And that's how it was. Uh, actually. Uh, my great-grandmother's uh, mother, Baroness von Rosen, committed suicide so that they could escape. So that's how tough it was for these families to escape through, out of Russia. So finally they went out into the steppes and Cossacks were coming at them and um, it turns out they were white and they ended up. So in um, seven days after the murder of the royal family, my great-grandfather was with those troops that arrived into Ekaterinburg. Um, next slide, please. Um, and um, they found that the, the, royal, uh, the, the royal family, the servants, next slide, um, uh, had been taken first from, okay, first from St. Petersburg to the Bulls of Ekaterinburg. So go to the next slide. And um, so when the white troops arrived into Ekaterinburg, they found this uh, double fence around the Apatyev house. My great-grandfather ordered the troops to tear down the fence. His adjutant, who later became my uh, grandfather, Kirill Mikhailovich Narishkin, um, was, uh, went down into the basement and he saw what happened. My great-grandfather did not have the nerve, I guess, to go see. So an investigation of the murder was started. Next. And um, these are the killers. Uh, Peter Yermakov, uh, Urovsky, the leader, Yermakov II. Uh, next slide. Um, they had taken them into the basement. This is what my grandfather saw, the basement. That photograph from the Harvard collection. Next slide. And, uh, see the other It's thinking. Uh, thinking. It's thinking. Anyway, so the investigation of the murder was started, and um, it it what it what it, uh, and there were had, there were two investigators, Namiotkin and Sergeyev, who were hired by the White Army, except that they really uh, they did a lot of good work, and they found out where all all what happened to them and so forth, where they were taken, except the White Army wasn't satisfied and fired them. And, and when uh, my great-grandfather then introduced Sokolov to the general staff as the men to do the investigation of the murder, and that's how Sokolov got his job. Um, Sokolov went to, uh, uh, well, first of all, what had happened at number three, uh, the place where the murder occurred uh, was down, down here in, in, uh, in Katienburg. The bodies were taken up to Ganyinayama, number one, and uh, number two is a, is a little road that goes off. 
and um, they were the bodies were dumped into the open pit. If you go to the next slide, uh, this is Nicholas Sokolov, 1919. Next. All right. So uh, Sokolov then took charge of the investigation, and uh, he, where he's standing now, he's standing. <coughs> All over the spot where there was one of the bonfires, and according to General Dietrich, there were two bonfires. One in the in the next slide. Uh, okay, Sokolov lost half a month pumping this water out of here, so maybe the bodies were underneath. Keep going. All right. So here is the open pit that. If you ever go to Ekaterinburg, you'll see this open mine shaft that is wider now, but this little crossing is still there. I went across it countless times. So the bodies were thrown into this pit. It was about 30 foot deep. And the White Army later on found underwater, they found a floor. And under the floor, they found uh, the girl's dog who was killed. So they went to they went to a lot to hide all the information, to hide everything as they could. But Sokolov used to come over our, our family home in, in France uh, after, the, after they got out of Russia and told them, uh, was telling them how when he first arrived to the open pit area, if you go to the next slide, um, right here, there was a fresh bed of clay. And um, so, first Sokolov, this pile of, of uh, gravel and so forth that you see was taken from the bottom of the mine shaft to see if there was anything. And it was left like that, actually for us, because Sokolov never had the time to go through it. Next slide. <coughs> the, the bodies were, were taken, um, in three days, there were about 50 people there trying to destroy these bodies that try to burn four of the bodies. Now, what we found out later that, you know, they tried to burn Alexis, Maria, the Tsar, and someone else. And Michael determined that because of the DNA also with the bones, or the heel bones, who were very light, and thus they're supposed to be heavy and dense. Um, well, the uh, the, bo the the uh, bodies were taken, uh, that were burnt, and then they were thrown back. Well, they tried to burn the phone. They were thrown into the uh, mine shaft. Uh, Fifty people were in this mine shaft in this area, working on this, and uh, everybody knew about it. They were going back and forth into the town. Pretty soon, the whole town knew where the bodies were, and so. The Galashok and the head of the whole investigation came to this place and told them, get rid of the bodies, let's take them to a, the mine on the way to Moscow. So they packed them up again on carts and carriage and finally on the truck like this and took them down this road, the Kaptiki Road. And it's still this, looks like this. Uh, because it's in July, it's very rainy and I can understand why the truck finally got stuck uh, next slide. Uh, got, got stuck underneath where this uh, wooden bridge is. This is a photograph taken by Sokolov. Sokolov hired uh, hundreds of people to comb the forest, to go across it and to, we're going, maybe they were going five yards apart looking for a grave. Many times he went through this area and never once did he think perhaps that that's where the grave is. And this is exactly where the nine sets of remains were found underneath this little bridge. Next slide. This is a photograph that we found in the archives. This is Peter Yermakov, the killer. And in the back of the photograph, written in pencil, it said, I'm standing on, in Russian, I'm standing on the grave of the Tsars. And um, right away, we, it, of course, this was it. We knew. And uh, perhaps we thought, you know, when Avdonian, you know, it, it eventually opened up the grave, they found the skulls and uh, took them for examination. Next slide. 
um, but they um, they weren't able to determine anything. So uh, and also they had to keep the secret because Russia was still communist. And uh, for another photograph, an interesting photograph Sokolov took, right here is the Kartiki Road. But here's this spot right here is where they actually found the remains of Alexis and Maria. This is the southern part of the Pig's Meadow. When we search this area, our third search, and uh, I went back to this area here because we searched the whole northern area. I went back to the spot and I started taking photographs. We had Tajiki workers and so forth. And I was actually standing on the grave of the children. I didn't even know it. So this is how difficult this work is. Next slide. Um, Sokolov never found the remains. He concluded wrongly, and I repeat wrongly, that all the remains were burnt. Because he really had no proof to determine that. What we do know is that from the archives and from the, what the killers wrote, uh, when the killers took the bodies to the uh, pigs, uh, to the Four Brothers Mine area, there was an expert that was supposed to come to uh, to burn the bodies, except that that guy never made it because he fell off his horse and broke his leg. So then Peter Yermakov was given the task of trying to burn the bodies as this whole, and after being taken out of the water, the bodies were totally frozen from the cold water. They, they weren't even burning, so, so they, they just gave up on that. Um, Sokolov finally made it. Uh, my great-grandfather was transferred to Vladivostok, where he became the military governor of the whole of Moor region. And um, Sokolov came there. In 1920, uh, in January, there was a coup against my great-grandfather, and pff, the Japanese saved my family. Sokolov left Russia with a proof of the murder, whatever he had. And he went with General Genin, the French general, into Harbin, and eventually met my, uh, the Japanese saved my family, and met my grandparents and my great-grandparents in, in uh, Japan. The, my grandparents, Nadishkins, and the Sokolovs uh, traveled together on a ship called Andre Le Bon, and this box, the proof of a murder, uh, it, well, there were many boxes, but the, especially this one, uh, it was uh, about this size. And, and um, it was taken uh, by Sokolov and held by Sokolov. And it was kept, uh, when they traveled around the world, it was kept under, under my grandmother's bunk. So, so uh, one day while guarding the box, nobody, they always guarded the box, even on the ship. And um, I come to hear from Sokolov's grandson, I took that photograph, Sokolov's house has that box, that um, Mao Zedong was traveling on the scene, uh, going to France as well. So uh, very, very interesting. So um, next slide, please. Um, in the box, we had the Dr. Botkin's dentures uh, in the box, we had um, uh, 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 melted fat bullets, um, the pieces of wood where the bayonet uh, stabs went with blood and so forth. Um, a lot of those items now, if you ever care to go, are up in the museum in, in, the, uh, in Jordanville at our uh, monastery. There's a very nice museum that you can go visit, and those are what the items of the box. There was also the Empress's finger. Next slide, please. And um, the, um, but we have, uh, we don't know where that is yet. Uh, maybe someone had kept it uh, or something like that. In 1978, uh, Alexander Avdonin, his wife, Galina Gilyaryabov, his wife, and another friend um, decided to search for the remains. Of, of Nicholas II and, and the royal family. Uh, they were all enthusiasts and they were really protected by uh, the Ministry of the Interior over there, the MVD. Uh, next. And um, so they opened up the grave. The, 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 they found the bridge. They climbed up. The bridge, of course, was covered with dirt, but they climbed up on a tree and they, they, they were able to see 
the the you know the the the, uh, the silhouette of the of the bridge and they opened it up and they found three skulls. Uh, two or skulls were taken to Moscow for uh, for them to check out and then and then um, and then and they were brought back and uh, and they were put back in the grave and until and they decided to keep the secret until Russia changed. And in 1991. Uh, Dr. Galeryabov uh, uh, told the world what they found. Next, and you can see the the previous picture. The skeleton number four was of the Tsar. Um, in in that grave that they opened up, there were nine sets of remains, and they found that two were missing: the one of the daughters and also Sergei Alexei. Everybody else was found. Um, I can tell you right now that, uh, and Father Victor knows that in 1995, when they tried to, they did DNA, I was given the shavings from the DNA samples that when they cut the bones and uh, they sent them to, to uh, it was brought to my house, gave Father Victor half and I kept the other half and I put them by our wedding icons. It was around midnight. I went back into the kitchen and uh, my wife Masha was also the witness, and then I, and an hour later I went back into the bedroom, and the whole bedroom smelled like roses. And when I went to that piece of there's a piece of paper with uh, shavings or like uh, dust of, of from the bones, and and uh, but from 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 the little shavings from Nicholas II and from Dr. Bodkin. The, the aroma of roses was so strong that it smelled up the whole room. And that, that was just incredible. And I, I gave it to a priest, uh, so I felt that I didn't feel that I was uh, worthy to keep something like that. So, next. And this is how the remains, by the way, that was how the remains lay for seven years, that more. Now, my friend, Dr. Sergei Kitin started doing the reconst facial reconstruction over the skulls. Dr. Bodkin Demidova, next slide, please. Uh, Olga Nikolai, you gone. Tatiana Anastasia, and next slide, Trup Alexandra. Next. All right. So we had a, and I asked uh, Dr. Nikitin how he determined that they had Anastasia because the American scientist says that you have might have the wrong daughter, you, your Anastasia is missing and you have Maria. Well, it's because he did also photo superimposition. This is Nikitin's reconstruction of, Anasta of Anastasia. This is her, pho uh, this is her photograph. <coughs> this is Anastasia's reconstruction. This is the photograph of Maria over here. And um, so, as you can see, with a there's certain points that he measured, and the points match exactly, and the shape of the head matches exactly. And uh, also, it, when we compare it to Maria, the points do not match up. Only one matches, but the shape of the head does not match up. There were other things involved too that, uh, you know, the, the uh, forensic uh, uh, things that were told, but uh, basically, the Russians were convinced that they had Anastasia Maria was missing. And that became a bone of contention uh, at one point when I took American scientists to Russia in, in February 1998 before the burial of the royal family. Um, uh, I took uh, Dr. Anthony Falsetti from the University of Florida Gainesville and Dr. Diane France from Colorado State University, both director of Human ID Labs, both forensic anthropologists. And they determined, uh, they also saw by, like they also agreed with Dr. William Maples of Florida also that, that the Russians had the wrong daughter. But uh, so then um, I went, I went to back to the Russians and I said, who, I asked them who determined, I didn't know that Nikitin had done this, who determined that you had uh, Anastasia? And they all point at Nikitin. I said, well, the Americans will present their paper in front of the Academy of Forensic Science in the year 2000, saying that you're wrong. So Nikitin came to America, presented his paper in front of the Academy of American Academy of Forensic Science, uh, proving his case that um, that indeed that 
uh, Maria was missing. And uh, my whole thing was that we'll determine really that when we found, if and when we find the next set of remains. So next, please. So this is Nikitin's work. He did a reconstruction of, actually this is Diane France. She sent a, a, a photo, uh, a, a, a scan of her own skull and to see how close it is, uh, how close his work is amazing. So I, I have no doubt with Nikitin's work, well, really. Nikitin, and Nikitin uh, next, please. Then there was a burial in 1998. Next slide. So we decided to start searching for the other two children. Next. So when we came, this is what we found. They had cleared the forest area. <coughs> and uh, and um, as you can see, um, the, the, on the right side behind, the church put up a cross there, and it said that all the remains were burnt. I said, they're wrong, you know. We'll find the other the, the spot. And behind already the open pit, Sokolov already had opened it up more. Next slide, please. So <laughs> remember from the mine shaft, right? Next. And this is us already working on that pile. Next. That's Dr. Abdonian, September 98. Next. That's myself, Abdonian. And next. And I found the first bullet from Nagan pistol. I got a shot of vodka for that. <laughs> and and, um, and th that was in that pile of stones. Next because they, what they did is they took off all their clothing and everything, and they all wore the diamonds and all this. So we found a lot of, uh, uh, we found, um, uh, but on the third day I found a, a white topaz stone. Sokolov found 14, I found the 15th one. Um, we found, um, we continued, we didn't find that many items, but we did find continued Finding what Sokolov found. Next. Um, I found the button. I found, you see the snap on top. The back was still in there. That meaning the clothes were ripped off. They're ripped. It wasn't, they weren't gentle. Um, next. And they found bones, but they, Sokolov found bones as well. They were animal bones. Next. Okay, next. So, in 1998, uh, we're still searching. We also found, interesting, red wax in the mine shaft. Alexei carried red wax in his pocket, and that was proof to us, and nails he carried too, uh, but he carried red wax. Uh, he played with it, and that was proof to us that he was there. Next. We did a uh, seismic profiling of the whole area, and the electro back there, uh, uh, next. Electromagnetic studies as well, finding anomalies. We checked every single one of them out and nothing, nothing panned out. Next. It started to snow. So then we had to, next, we moved the whole pile of stones. And the pile of stones also uh, had, um, had uh, uh, we got charcoal and all that in there. But next. Such a, such a beautiful place. So many horrible things happen. Next. And the second search was in June 1999. Next. So everything, was, the flowers came back, everything came back. And what we're looking for is also the bonfires. Because that what the killers wrote, Yurovsky, was that after they, the, the, the two children, after they burned the bodies of those two children, they buried them next to a bonfire. And then they, they, they covered that up and they built a bonfire on top of that. And so we were looking for signs of the bonfire. And the only, and what, that's one of the reasons we started working at the Four Brothers Mine area, because there were, um, under General Dietrich's map of the whole area, two X's signified bonfires. And that's what, that's what we found. And we actually, I did it by, compass and steps like they said, you know, and I found, we found those two bonfires. Next. So we're looking, next. 
So we started searching for uh, these, these bonfires. Next. And we found traces of charcoal everywhere that was spread out. Next. And here was one of the fires. This was Sokolov, you saw in the first picture, Sokolov standing. This is the exact spot where he was standing. There was a bonfire underneath. We found nothing in the, because he already had gone through it. Also, um, right now, there's a sidewalk over it. So, you know, they don't know, they didn't know that. They just put a sidewalk right over it. That, that it was, so this was destroyed instead of being kept. Go ahead. Um, one thing is, Remember I told you about the fresh bed of, of clay? We dug down about 20 centimeters. We found a site of a huge bonfire about the size of this table. Um, the the, the uh, clay was already brick. And we found this melted neck of a bottle. The fire was so hot. And that's where they burned the bodies. And, and then we saw that they had swept all the coal into the uh, mine shaft. There was, coal never disappears. And uh, so this is what we found. The earth doesn't lie. Go, keep going. And this is what the Four Brothers mine area looks now. Actually, it's fancier, but this is the mine shaft and people go. It's a holy ground. It's a holy place. Uh, okay, next. The third search was in t July 2004. Keep going. And we went to the pig's meadow. This is the actual grave where the bridge was, that you saw that photograph. And uh, people come and pray. It's a very quiet place, but the church, uh, uh, the local, the, the church, uh, they used to go in their religious processions, uh, through this area here. But because they don't believe that these are the remains, they built a separate road going to the Four Brothers Mine area. So, all right, next. So I can, we're comparing, th this is the whole northern area. Of, uh, the, so the truck came down this way and that's where it got stuck. Okay, next. So we hired Tajikistani workers to search out the whole area, plus we had, next. We're, we had a radar, that's all we had at the time. So we're searching the area for radar, looking for signs of any digging or something like that. Keep going. Um, we hired equipment to level out the ground so the radar could work better, but uh, you know, nothing, you know, keep going. And uh, whenever we found something, uh, we, like a signal like this, that means somebody had dug here, we would have to open it up again. Next. So we searched and uh, nothing was found here. Next. And the final search was in July 2007, that, but it wasn't done by me, it was done by a, a, um, a local uh, group of uh, uh, Russian army uh, who, who um, uh, a club who um, go to battlefields to try to find remains. And um, so this is the northern area over here that we searched out, and this was left over here to do. This is what I wanted to do in 2007, but I didn't get a chance. They did, in this spot right here, go ahead, they found the grave of Alexey and Maria. Next. And that's all that was found from two bodies. That is all. And you notice this curve over here, that's from bullet hole. And, um, but, you could, but scientists determined that in these they have a very young male and a very young female. Keep going. Okay, keep going. Okay, keep going. So nine bodies were found and um, 70 meters away from, from the set, from the other set, keep going. And um, so what I did then is when Nikitin called me, I, I, um, I decided, I called up Dr. Um, uh, Falsetti, University of Florida, who wanted to go and study these remains as an anthropologist. And in speaking to him, I said, by the way, do you know the, the head of the U.S. Army DNA lab? He says, uh, yeah, I do. His name is Finelli. He says, uh, I said, boy, I would love to get up to do the DNA study of these things. Maybe we could organize it. You know, I could organize it. And um, I spoke to the Russians, Vladimir Solovyov, and uh, 
Dr. Nikolai Devolin from uh, Ekaterinburg, and they all, yeah, they all agreed, let's do it, let's do the DNA. So that's when I wrote, um, actually, Falsetti spoke to Finelli and, uh, and <laughs> two Italian boys, you know, but uh, very fine people, believe me, fine people. And uh, Colonel, uh, <coughs> Colonel uh, Finelli decided to come on board with the U.S. Army DNA Lab, and hence uh, Dr. Michael Kobel, please. <laughs> uh, after uh, Dr. Kobel finishes, I will continue, and I'll talk to you about if. Uh, let me know when when you want to take a break, uh, Father. If you want to take a break, but um, after I'll talk about our search for. Um, uh, Alex, uh, uh, Mikhail Alexander Romanov. Dr. Kovl. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. And uh, again, I uh, personally would like to apologize for the late start. Um, the technology can be uh, a bit of a problem. And uh, it reminds me that uh, Father Victor did admonish me for not learning more Russian. but. I'll tell you this story that a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine from California, he said he was in, he was in South Korea and he was giving a presentation and the day before his talk he noticed that a lot of the speakers who were giving their talks in Korean, they would, they would constantly say, you know, some word like koshong, koshong, koshong. So he thought maybe they're saying thank you and so that evening, everyone he met, he would say, Koshon, Koshon, Koshon. And so finally someone said, why are you telling everyone next slide? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm afraid what Russian I may speak may not mean much, so. Okay, okay I think I'll go ahead and get started um, so that we can, uh, again, apologize for the late start. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the uh, DNA identification work that we did at the Armed Forces DNA Identification Laboratory. Uh, this laboratory used to be in Rockville, Maryland. It's now been relocated to uh, Dover, Delaware. Um, so if we could uh, go ahead with the next slide. So I no longer work for the Armed Forces DNA Identification Lab for AFDIL. Um, when the lab decided to move to Dover, I uh, made a career decision to uh, stay in the area. So I now work at NIST. National Institutes of Standards and Technology in Gaithersburg. Uh, so the work I'm going to talk about is the work that I did when I was at AFDIL, but again, I'm not speaking on behalf of the laboratory, and anything that I say, opinions are strictly mine and not the opinion of uh, the Department of Defense. So when you do these types of historical uh, investigations, it's often important that you have uh, replication of work and so we had um, in, in this particular study we had our group at AFDIL so it's taking there we go we had our, our scientists at AFDIL that were working on this this uh, problem and then I asked the Russian authorities if I could also invite a good collaborator from a laboratory in Austria in Innsbruck so they were in parallel doing the same work. We had two Russian scientists that were staying with us in, in uh, Rockville, and there were two Russian scientists who were in Austria who were doing the work alongside our colleagues there. Um, and then what we did is we did not talk to one another. So we did our testing, Austria did their testing, and then we sent our work to a third party. And that was uh, Dr. Peter Gill. Dr. Peter Gill uh, was in the UK, is in the UK, and he was involved with the early testing in the 1990s. He was the, the British lab that did the original work. And so he looked at our results, he looked at the Austrian results, and he wrote a report that said they both came to the same conclusion independently of one another. Okay. So I thought it would probably be best to give a very brief, um, a very brief, brief background on how to do forensic DNA testing, and it'll be like an episode of CSI. We'll do it in five minutes. It really takes a lot longer to uh, 
to, to do these types of testing, but um, I'll give you just the brief overview of how we do forensic DNA testing. So if you take a look at a cell, at a human cell, you actually have two human genomes. So you have the big blue circle there, the big blue ball is the nucleus of the cell. And in that nucleus you have uh, the DNA that makes the code for proteins and uh, you know, codes for, for all the various functions that you do uh, and so forth. And this is where you get a lot of very high power of discrimination. When you're talking about forensic testing and you may hear in, you know, in a court case that there's a quintillion times you know, probability that this person does. Uh, so that's the type, type of testing that you're doing, the nuclear DNA testing, very powerful. Um, the other genome that you have is the mitochondria, which are these little uh, circular uh, structures that one of the main functions of the mitochondria is to provide energy for the cell. And interestingly, they have their own DNA. It's DNA that's separate from the nucleus. So you actually have two types of DNA in your cell. You have the nuclear DNA that you inherit from your mother and father. You get half of your DNA from your mom and half from your dad. Um, three billion bases of information. And then you have the mitochondria, which are actually, uh, the ge mitochondrial genome is quite small, 16,000 base pairs. But the advantage that mitochondria DNA gives to the forensic scientist is that when you have a very degraded sample, when you have a bone sample that's been in the ground for 50, 60, hundreds, uh, they're getting DNA from Neanderthals, so from, from thousands and hundreds of thousands of years. Then the mitochondrial DNA, because you have so many mitochondria, your, your cells need a lot of energy, then it can provide you with some information. So let's talk about the nuclear STR testing that we did. All right, so if you take a look in the nuclear genome, you will find certain regions where you have repetitive DNA. And so in this case, we're looking at a certain region of the chromosome. Again, you have two chromosomes, one from your mother and one from your father. And in this certain region, there's this repeat so you have the nucleotide bases, the four bases, A, G, C, T, that make up DNA. And you have in this one particular region this repeat, G, A, T, A. Four bases that repeat side by side by side. So gata, 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 gata. So on the bottom, the maternal chromosome, you have six of these repeats. And the chromosome you get from your father, you may have eight of these repeats. So the number of repeats can be very variable in the population. And so what we do is we make use of this variation in forensics and we, we have to first amplify this up. So there's this process called PCR, the polymerase chain reaction. It's kind of like a Xerox machine where you take one copy of a document, you put it on there and you make many thousands of documents from this. So um, we notice that we're uh, uh, on this, uh, the way this machinery works is that we have these little uh, short fragments of DNA that have this red dot attached to it. Uh, these are called primers and that red dot is a fluorescent dye. And so we amplify, we make copies. And so when you go through this process of PCR, if you hit the next uh, and hit it again, you make millions and millions and millions of copies of these fragments. Some of them have six repeats, some of them have eight repeats, and they all have this little red fluorescent dye attached to it. So we've been able to label these fragments with this red dye. So in the next step, we pass these little uh, labeled fragments through this machine called a capillary electrophoresis. So inside of the instrument, you have a capillary. Go ahead. And it's kind of hard to see, but this capillary is about the size of a hair. And so it's very thin. And inside of this capillary is a polymer. It's kind of like a pancake syrup. So it's very viscous. So 
because DNA has a negative charge, we put a positive charge on one end of the capillary and the DNA starts swimming to that positive end. So as the DNA is passing through the capillary, the little size, the six size fragments, the, si the fragments with the six repeats, they're able to move a little bit quicker than the eight repeat fragments. So we're getting separation of the six and the eight. And they eventually get to this little spot in the capillary where a laser shines through. And when that laser hits that red dye, it gives off a red signal. And that signal gets captured and gets transformed into a red peak that you're seeing here. So this is the six repeat and this would be the eight repeat. So we're able to actually visualize how many repeats were amplified from this particular individual. Now, the FBI decided back in 1997 that the U.S. would study, we would all look at the same 13 markers. So these are called the CODIS loci, and this is what makes up our national DNA database. So we look at 13 pieces of information and when you look at 13 different pieces of information you can get the type of power that can give you an individualization. So we could tell my profile would be different from anyone else's profile in this room if we look at those 13 pieces of information. In fact, the only way that you would predict that it would match is if I had an identical twin. In that case, you do share the exact same DNA. Okay. So this is an example of a kit that's used in forensics. It's actually looking at 16 pieces of information. So the first marker I want to point out is this marker. It's amylogenin. It's used as a sex type marker. So we can tell whether the person is a male or female. And in this particular sample, we only see one X, that's because this is a female. Females have two X chromosomes, XX, males are XY. So the reason you only see one peak, why don't you see two peaks, is because both of those X's are sitting on top of one another. So there's actually two peaks there, but they're sitting, they're the same uh, size, so they're both sitting on top of one another. If this were a male sample, you would see an X peak and a Y peak, so you would see two separate peaks. And then we have 15 pieces of information, the 13 CODIS loci that we all test in the U.S. And then there are two markers that are unique to this kit. So there are 15 total markers. Okay. Now, what's the probability that I would find someone else in the world who has this particular type? One in 129 quadrillion. So that's the basically... That's saying it's the same probability of taking 129 quadrillion white marbles and putting in one red marble and then sticking your hand in there and picking out the one red. That's about the same probability uh, for this particular profile. Now, this is actually my daughter's profile. Um, my daughter, Sophia, who my wife and I adopted, Sophia, from Russia, and her, her little brother, Matthew. So whenever Sophia asks me, Dad, am I special? I'm like, yeah, 129 quadrillion. I'd say that's pretty special. But she doesn't quite get that. She doesn't get my jokes most of the time. Actually, she does most of the time. So now we have the nuclear DNA, but there's also, again, uh, a couple of things I want to point out. Go ahead. Those are the autosomes, those are the nuclear DNA that we're using for STRs that we do in this type of testing. We also have the sex chromosomes. We have XX again, if you're a female, two Xs, males XY. And then there's also outside of the nucleus, in the cytoplasm of the cell, we have mitochondria, which have their own genome, the mitochondrial DNA. And there's a little bit of a relationship between mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome because of the way they are inherited. So if we take a look at your DNA and we take a look at your great-grandparents, as Peter mentioned, his great-grandfather, uh, you are about one-eighth 
of your, all of your great-grandparents. So you have eight great-grandparents, and you are about one-eighth of all of your great-grandparents. And we can keep going back, you know, one-sixteenth, your great-great-grandparents, and so forth. We can keep going back in time, and you can figure out what percentage of your family uh, you inherited from all of your relatives, uh, immediate relatives in your family tree. But when it comes to the Y chromosome, men only get the Y chromosome from their father, who got it from their father, who got it from their father, and from their father. So even though you have four great-grandfathers, only one of those great-grandfathers passed his Y down to you. So, uh, so that's a really unique feature about Y chromosome testing is that you can find relatives that share the same Y type when you're trying to do a human identification. Okay? So this is a, uh, their, their STRs, or these short tandem repeats, are also on the Y chromosome. Um, and for the most part, you only see one peak at each marker here. So there's one peak, and there's one peak, and there's one peak. And that's because you men only have one Y chromosome, so you don't have two so you, you don't see two peaks like you do with the nuclear DNA where you have your mother and your father have given you DNA. Now, why STR testing has been used a lot in forensics um, and in a lot of historical cases like the, the case of uh, Esten Hemmings who, um, uh, Esten Hemmings' mother was Sally Hemmings uh, who was a slave of Thomas Jefferson. And um, so one of the descendants of Esten Hemmings uh, said, you know, I've been told that uh, my father was, my, my great-great-great-grandfather uh, was Thomas Jefferson, and I'd like to go to this party that they have, the Jefferson family has every year in Charlottesville. I'd like to come. And they said, hmm, no, we don't, we, don't think, uh, we don't think that's right. I don't think you actually are. And so they said, well, let's do this Y testing. And when they did, uh, so if you take a look at, uh, uh, so I have to say, you know, Jefferson had, uh, I think he had one daughter or two daughters. He didn't have any sons that we know of. And so uh, if you look at other relatives, they had the same Y chromosome as Esten Hemmings. And it, it's a really rare Y chromosome. So it's not like there were a lot of these. So now we can't say with definitive proof that Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson was the father um, of, of Esten Hemmings, but uh, we can say that someone with a Jeffersonian Y chromosome was the father of Esten Hemmings. So there's a limit to how much real identification you can do with Ys. It's really powerful for, uh, dis for saying it's definitely not him. So like, for example, Sally Hemmings had another son, Thomas Woodson, and he had a different Y chromosome. So we can conclusively say that was not, he was not fathered by a Jeffersonian chromosome. Now, on the other side of the coin is the mitochondrial DNA, and it's kind of like the Y in that the mitochondria is only passed from mother to daughter. And so all of the women in here got your mitochondria from your mother, and you'll pass it on to any daughters that you have. Now, men also have mitochondria. So, you know, the mitochondria are very important for functioning. We all have mitochondria, but when it comes to passing it on to the next generation, only the females will pass their mitochondria onto the next generation. So again, it can be quite useful and these human identity, if you could find relatives that belong in this family tree, you could use as comparison. Now we look at the sequence because the mitochondrial genome is so small, we simply look at the sequence of the DNA and we do a comparison. What is the uh, differences between the sequence that you're looking at and a reference sequence. So we would say this particular person at position 263, the reference sequence has an A, this person has a G. So that's the way we would report uh, mitochondrial DNA. And I'll take just a second to, sh to say that this, this work really, a lot of the work, uh, the, the analysis work can, can go quite uh, quickly. Uh, a lot of the work depends upon the, the type of sample that you're looking at. So as Peter mentioned, these bones that have been buried for a hundred years and the frozen, you know, the ground in, in uh, Ekaterinburg is frozen for about eight months of the year. 
Um, so you go through a little bit of freeze-thaw over 100 years. Um, the types of bacteria that are living in the soil. Bone is a very nice source of calcium, so uh, there are minerals there, so there's a lot of feeding that happens on the, on the material. So you take the bone and you try to first try to sand away any of the, you know, and if there are any anthropologists in the room, I apologize. But anthropologists love to pick up bones and, you know, hand them, lick them, and look at them. And so you have to be careful that you make sure you're getting rid of any external uh, contamination. And then you grind the bone up into a powder, and then you digest this into a buffer, and that will help to release the DNA there. And so you're hoping that you're getting the DNA that's actually from the bone and not from some outside contaminant. So as Peter mentioned, uh, but because of the work that Avdovan did, um, we have the excavation in, in the early 90s of the, um, uh, of the first grave that was discovered. And uh, as Peter mentioned, there was some debate uh, because the American anthropologists believed that Anastasia was missing. They both agreed that there was a boy missing, that Alexei was not there. But the, the other daughter that was missing, the American experts believed that um, it was Anastasia and the Russians believed that it was Maria. And so based upon the work that the Russians did, the, the facial reconstruction, um, we'll, we'll, uh, for this talk, we'll move forward and say yes, that it was Maria that was missing. So, go ahead. So I'll talk very briefly about what Peter Gill did in 1991. Uh, and so he published his paper in 1994 in Nature Genetics, and he used the STR testing that we're using today. At the time, they were only looking at a few, um, looking here at five STRs. Remember, today we're using 13. And we're getting ready to move in the U.S. to 20 uh, starting in 2017. So we're getting ready to look at more information. But at the time, there were only five STRs that were tested. And what Peter Gill could show is he could determine there was uh, some of these skeletons look like they're related. And there's some skeletons that are absolutely not related. So these were the four servants that had different uh, profiles. Okay. And so, based upon the DNA work that was performed in the early 1990s, uh, this is what Peter Gill was able to determine using mitochondrial sequencing and STR testing, is that you had uh, remains that were consistent with Alexandra, uh, the Tsarina, and three of her daughters, and they used as a reference someone in that maternal lineage, His Royal Highness Prince Philip, as a reference. He is a uh, it was a cousin of the Tsarina, and so, um, or I should say Empress, and so um, they asked him for a sample of his blood, and he donated it, and they looked at the mitochondrial sequence, and it matched. Now, for the Tsar, it was a little bit different, because when you looked at his reference, the Tsar had what, a condition, what we call heteroplasmy, and that is that some of his mitochondrial DNA at this one position, 16169, had the T base, which I have in red, and some of his mitochondria had the C base. And so when you put those two together, one more time, you get in the sequence what looks like a mixture. A little bit of T, and uh, underneath a, a CP. Here. So at this one position, it looks like a mixture of two people, but you didn't see this anywhere else, only at this one position. And so um, when uh, Pavel um, Ivanov came uh, to the U.S., uh, he's the Russian scientist who was involved uh, with uh, this first round of testing, and he met the, the director of AFDIL at the time, um, and uh, uh, Dr. Victor Whedon, and he said, you know, there's a lot of people that are having doubts about this heteroplasmy because at the time, scientists didn't really know a whole lot about heteroplasmy. So he said, uh, can I come to AFDIL and we do some more testing? So, uh, so he did, and what he did was they exhumed uh, Georgi, the czar's brother, uh, who died of tuberculosis, 
and they exhumed his remains. And when you looked at the mitochondrial DNA of the czar and Georgi, you see the same heteroplasmy in the same position, but in different ratios. So this is where the Armed Forces DNA Lab first became involved, and we were able to show that, that this was not such a rare event, that it did happen, especially in this, uh, in this lineage. Okay. Now, despite the overwhelming evidence, there were a lot of concerns by people who were trying to discount the DNA testing. They were saying, well, you know, this heteroplasmy, we're not really sure what that's about. Um, at the time, the mitochondrial DNA databases were quite small, just a few hundred people. So the statistics were not that overwhelming, but they were still substantial. And STRs were in their infancy. So fast forward now, 2007, as Peter mentioned, uh, it, the news came out that we think we found the, um, the, the two missing children. And that's a, a picture that I took of uh, Peter with the, uh, the men who were, in, the, the men standing beside of Peter were involved with the actual discovery. And uh, this is a local um, uh, archaeologist who, was, who did the dig, who actually did the excavation. As Peter mentioned, this is pretty much what we had. These were the largest bones there. There were 44 bones or bone fragments, and I think there were, of those 40, I think there were three teeth um, uh, there. Now, if you think about it, you have over 200 bones in your body, and there are two people here. So out of over 400 bones, you have less than 40 bones, um, fragments that were still there. So much of that material is gone, has been burned, or has disintegrated over time. So there were only a few bones that were really sufficient for DNA testing. And so that was the question, are these the remains of the two missing children? So we have the sequence, the mitochondrial sequence from Peter Gill, okay? Go ahead. This is a, uh, a bone uh, from a leg, it's a, from a, a fragment of the leg. Um, oh, one thing I will mention, um, about this is that these are only portion of a leg bone. So the anthropologists didn't have the luxury of doing these measurements to determine the height and maybe then they could definitively prove or, or at least suggest that this was, you know, Alexand uh, uh, Anastasia or Maria. So the anthropology was quite limited in the, the remains that were recovered. Here's another fragment from a right femur, from a right leg bone, a uh, thigh bone that uh, was tested. Um, and the sequence we got was the same that Peter Gill generated back in the 1990s. And I remember when this happened, um, uh, we, we had Alexis uh, Zakharin was our translator. He stayed with us the entire time because the two Russian scientists spoke no English. Uh, very little English, and uh, he was there with us, and when this sequence came up on the computer, everyone started crying. I mean, even though, you know, we had all of this, you know, we had all of this proof, I mean, we had all of this information that it was them, that it was the two missing children, but once we saw this sequence, um, everyone just broke down and was crying because it really meant a lot that we finally found the two missing children. So of all the fragments that we tested that we could get DNA from, again, we tested 10 pieces of 10 bones. Uh, the bones that we could get DNA from, they all had the same sequence, all right? But that doesn't tell you whether that was from Alexi or Maria. It just tells you that, you know, of the bones that were recovered, we had a pretty good idea that one was from a female, one was from a male based upon the anthropology. This time, we didn't have a database of two or 300, we had a database of 21,000. We've never seen this sequence before, so it's a unique sequence, again, which means that it's pretty rare, okay? We also did STR testing, and so we took um, the fragment from uh, what's believed to be a male, and we see the two peaks, X and Y, which means that's from a male, and we see the one X peak here. 
from a female. And the one thing that you notice when you look across this profile, I'm only showing you here uh, three markers, the sex marker and then two other STR markers. When you look at the DNA profiles, you notice that, go ahead, there's a lot of sharing going along. The one peak here the brother has, the sister has, or the, the putative sister has the, also that peak. So that suggests that these two individuals may be brother and sister. So we did this statistical test. We generated the profile of the, of the female and the male. And we did this statistical test that's done um, for paternity testing and, and kinship testing. And we simply asked two questions. This is called a likelihood ratio. We simply asked two questions. Calculate the statistics as if these two individuals here are in fact brother and sister. And then calculate the statistics as if these two people were two people I grab at random in the population that are not related. So we have two different statistics that we calculate and then we take the ratio, which one makes most sense, which one explains the data better. Is it more uh, information that they are related or that they're not related? And when you did this test, you found that it was 5.6 million times more likely that the remains are brother and sister than if the remains were two people we picked out of the population. So very strong evidence that these are related individuals, brother and sister. As Peter mentioned, because of the previous testing that was done, the lab in Ekaterinburg kept some of that material, that DNA material from the czar, the czarina, and the three daughters. So we're able to get um, STR testing on all of the family. And when you do that, you notice here on top is the czar, here on the bottom is the czarina, and in the middle here we have Alexi. And when you look at the peaks, go ahead, you can see that every peak in this child can be explained if the czar and the czarina were the mother and father. So as you would expect, a child gets half his DNA from the mother and half from the father. And we'll do this again for the female, for the skeletal sample, we get at every peak, we can explain her profile from the czar and the czarina. So we developed profiles for everyone, and when we did that uh, likelihood ratio test, when we asked the question, these two individuals, the boy and the girl, do they belong into this family tree with the czar, the czarina, and the three sisters? Well, for the girl, her probability was 4.3 trillion, and for Alexei, it was 80 trillion. So the, the results are 4.6 trillion to 80 trillion times more likely if these two individuals are in, in this family tree than if there were just two people at random in the population that would fit into this pedigree. So since we did have um, Alexi and we did have the czar, we decided to do Y chromosome testing back in the early 90s. There was no YSTR testing at that time. So when you look at the profile from the czar, which is on top, or I'm sorry, from Alexi and from the czar, they match at all. We look at 17 markers. They all matched exactly at all 17. And then as a relative, we used uh, Andrew Romanoff from uh, California. He's a cousin of both uh, Nicholas and Alexi. And when you look at his profile, he matches at all 17. So we had a, a perfect match between um, a living relative and the remains from uh, Nicholas and Alexi. As far as the uh, rarity, how often do you see this? Well, in 20,000, a database of 20,000 YSTR types, we haven't seen this, this uh, haplotype before, so it's quite rare. So I'll take just a second and talk about the work that the ladies in Ekaterinburg, these are the, the, the ladies that work at the DNA lab in Ekaterinburg. Again, um, 
two of these uh, uh, ladies came to, uh, uh, actually on the right and the left, came to the U.S., and two of the scientists went to Austria. Now, they did DNA testing along with Dr. Rogayev on um, this sh shirt, bloody shirt, uh, that Nicholas wore. So when Nicholas was a young man, um, his father sent him on a world tour, and during a stop in uh, Japan, um, he was attacked by a, uh, a, a, someone who was mentally disturbed, who I think was dressed as a policeman, but uh, he had a saber, he came, and he hit Nicholas on the side of his head and you know, created this huge gash. Uh, and so Nicholas was bleeding all over his shirt. In fact, uh, Nicholas's cousin was able to stop the attack. He had just bought a bamboo stick as a souvenir uh, just, just minutes before. And when he, when he looked around and saw Nicholas being attacked, he hit the guy with the stick and was able to disable him so that they stopped this guy from killing him. Um, and so... The, uh, uh, the, the wounds were present there the, uh, you know, as far as the anthropology goes, but uh, I won't mention, I'm not an anthropologist, so I won't talk too much about that. But the shirt that Nicholas was wearing was sent back to, uh, to, to Moscow for after the attack and uh, was, was as proof of what had happened. And so uh, eventually the shirt made its way to the Hermitage Museum and um, so, you know, here in the 2009, 2010, we're doing te DNA testing, and um, uh, Mr. Slobiev says, hey, you know, uh, he calls up the Hermitage and he says, you, you guys have this shirt with blood from, from Nicholas. You think we could do some testing on that? And they said, no, we can't find this shirt. We have no idea where it is. You know, they wasn't there. Was, they had not didn't have a lot of good record keeping and so forth. They knew at some point in the 1930s that uh, it had it was in some mu museum of the revolution or something, and then it was sent. And so they no one had really any idea where it was. Well, at about the same time, th there was a lot of pilfering of artifacts that was going on at the Hermitage. So they decided. Uh, let's and thanks to donations from from friends of the Hermitage Museum and so forth, they were able to get them a computer system where they could document everything. And so they're going through and they open up this drawer and they see something wrapped in this brown paper. They open it up and they found the shirt and the hat, the, the derby hat that he was wearing. So uh, so the Russians were quite excited. Well, you know, can, can we do can we do DNA testing? Well, what do you plan to do? Well, we're gonna you know we'll cut out a little bit of the you know. No, there'll be no cutting. So they said it was okay to take like a Q-tip and some water and sort of rub the blood and, you know, there you go. That's what you can do. So that's what they did. Um, and just to show the beauty of this shirt, the, the craftsmanship. craftsmanship. Um, and, um, you know, so this is the tag 1931 is the tag that was on it. Go ahead. And so you can see they took a, a sample up here from the collar that had a little bit of crust on it, where the blood had sort of crusted uh, over time. And so, uh, again, you can see where they took a little bit of, of a Q-tip and a swab and sort of swabbed this area uh, where the blood was dripping down onto the shirt. They also uh, swabbed this area of the sleeve where Nicholas was holding the side of his head. So. The profile that the Russian scientists got was the exact same profile that we got from the bones. And they also did YSTR testing, and they got the same answer as we did for the Ys. So interestingly, you have a DNA profile from Nicholas when he was living, from the blood on the shirt, and we have the DNA profile from his bones after he died, and they matched. Do you have a question? Yeah, did he die when he ate his head? No, he didn't die. He survived the attack, and he went back home. Uh, uh -huh. But he, he survived that attack. <laughs> okay. And one. So we had complete concordance with... Uh, so... A lot of times, um, you know, DNA tends to get all of the glory, all of the honor, because it's used a lot in, in, in fighting crime. But I'd like to point out in this case that DNA is actually just one piece of the puzzle. When you take a look at all the other artifacts, like the bullets that were recovered, and 
uh, within those 44 bone fragments that Peter has talked about, there's a piece of pottery, which they know was used, the sulfuric acid was purchased uh, and used to try to uh, disintegrate the remains. So we found pieces of pottery with Japanese writing on it. So there's a lot of, of uh, information there. So if we take a look at the forensic DNA evidence, you have, you have evidence from the mitochondrial DNA, which agrees. You have evidence from the forensic STRs, which agrees that these are, in fact, members of this family. And you also have the Y chromosome evidence. So taken together, it's very strong evidence here from the DNA that we have the two missing children. Uh, Peter wanted me to mention about the work that Rogayev did on hemophilia. So we know that uh, hemophilia uh, ran, runs through the, the royal families of Europe because of Queen Victoria. And uh, with, with uh, Alexandra being a granddaughter of that Queen Victoria, uh, we know that Alexei had hemophilia. And so Rogayev was actually able to find, a lot of people think that... Um, that the uh, hemophilia was a, a deficiency in factor eight. We'll show that it's, that was not the case. But before we do that, one more quick review. The way that uh, you make a protein in your body, so if it's a protein like insulin or something like that, you start with a DNA that you have, and that gets transcribed into a message, and we call it messenger RNA. And that messenger RNA then gets made into a protein. So you have DNA makes messenger RNA makes a protein. Got a little soundtrack going on. So, um, so this is the way the DNA is organized. It seems a little crazy, but that's just the way it is. When you look at your DNA and you want to make a protein like one of these proteins that are used for clotting blood, the way the DNA is organized is you have these sequences called exons, which are in blue. That's what's actually transcribed into the message, the messenger RNA. And then you'll have these red regions, which are called introns, which are just junk DNA. It doesn't code for anything. It's just a bunch of gibberish. So it's kind of like reading a book, and you're reading, and you're reading like five or six pages, and then you've got like ten pages of gibberish. And you're like, uh, so you have to skip up, and then you pick back up and you start reading again. So this is the way that our DNA is organized. And they think that it's probably because if your DNA was just simply pure, this is the code for how to make this protein. And if a mutation happens, well, then you're pretty much in trouble because there's no way to correct that. So if a mutation happens in an intron, no big deal we can still get the information from the exon. So what happens is, when you go to make um, this message, the red parts are cut out, and the blue parts are put together to make this one message that then gets made into a protein. So the way that happens is you have enzymes that are reading the DNA, and they know exactly where to cut we're going to chop here, and we're going to cut out this intron. Okay, so if you take a look at blood clotting disorders, when you cut yourself, there's a lot of things happening. There's this cascade of enzymes will cut this, uh, this protein, and then that activates this. And, then that acti and so you eventually, uh, with all these little factors that are getting, uh, these, these factors that are uh, being created to create the clot, uh, it requires a lot of enzymes and proteins to do so. So one way that you can get hemophilia is if you are missing or if you have some issue with factor eight, which is one of the proteins in this process. The other way is if you have a deficiency in factor nine. So if you, if you knock out either one of these, then the pathway to making a clot is broken. And so you have issues. When you cut yourself, you can't stop the bleeding, or not very efficiently. So what they found was that when you look at here in this red, the red here represents all of the exons that are necessary for making factor nine, which is, again, one of these protein products. And what they thought, Rogaya found 
was that there was a mutation at this point here in the fourth exon for making factor nine. So basically what happened is instead of having the normal AAG, which is what the enzyme recognizes AAG, cut here, okay? Instead of it being an AAG, Alexi had an AGA. -A. So the, the mutation occurred and that the consequence of that is that the enzyme could not cut that exon from the intron. So in the next slide, what you get basically is this. No cutting, you produce a protein that has this. Both the exon and intron, and then the rest is good. But because you have all of this gibberish junk, when it go, comes time to make that protein, you don't make a proper protein. It, it makes a non-functional protein, so you can't clot. So that was the problem that Alexei had. So Rogaev was able to discover this, and he found that uh, not only was it present in the Tsarina, she was a carrier, uh, so usually females are protected because they have two X chromosomes. So if one copy of the gene is bad, then females have a backup copy, they have another X. But for males, it's usually, uh, usually afflicted because you only have one X chromosome. You don't have another X, you have a Y. So it's, it, it's, it's, um, that's why mostly males are afflicted by um, these blood clotting diseases. So Alexi had uh, only one X. Anastasia, had she lived, would have been a carrier for this hemophilia. She would have passed this gene. If she had had sons, they would have been afflicted. Uh, or uh, there's a 50-50 chance she would have passed it to any of her female children. And I'll finish up with, of course, there's always this uh, mythology about uh, the missing Romanov children, how uh, they, you know, somehow they miraculously survived that night. And the most uh, famous, at least, I think, was uh, Anna Anderson, who, uh, uh, who believed that she was uh, Anastasia and convinced a lot of people that she was Anastasia. When she died, um, she died of colon cancer. Um, she wanted her body cremated. And so this was before DNA testing, so that wasn't such a big thing. But uh, so once the DNA testing had happened, you know, we, we were in the early 90s with the discovery of uh, the, the missing family, the researchers were actually able to disprove that she was in fact Romanoff because the biopsy that she had taken uh, at the University of Virginia Hospital um, for, for, for colon cancer, um, they kept that biopsy material. And so they were able to go back and do DNA testing. And it's kind of hard to see here, but uh, the, the, uh, the, the STR testing here is, um, well, let me see if you'll pass my, if you can pass my test, all right? So here's your, I'll give you a certificate for, for being a forensic, a junior forensic scientist if you can answer this question. Is it possible for a father who's an 1132 and a mother who's a 3236 have a child that's a 1518? No. Okay, end of story. There's no way Anna Anderson could have been Anastasia because she does not have the same uh, DNA type that you would expect to be from a daughter of uh, the Tsar and the Tsarina. So in, since 1918, there have been a lot of people who have claimed to be um, one of the missing children. Um, there have been 81 men who claim to be Alexei. Um, Peter's friend um, Nikita once told me when we were in Russia, he said, yeah, you know, it's the funniest thing. There were five children went down into that basement and 200 came out. <laughs> so... So I think we can, uh, with, at least with the DNA testing, we can now um, uh, conclude that all of the children were executed that night, that early morning.